Uh, just days after the publication of the newest royal family official picture, you two yourselves have released a photograph, almost as though it was like an official picture. I think it's really nice that you see it that way. Well, the demand was high, so I thought to myself, I'll be damned if I'm going to be left out. Well, of course I've been left out of the official royal photograph. Uh, in fact, I was almost left out of our photograph. Yeah, the uh, cameraman and uh, some of the artistic consultants, they, uh, they thought the picture might look better if, uh, if Harry wasn't in it. A picture of you alone, then, Megan. Oh, but there were some logistical problems with that, so they uh, inserted me back in. Oh, good, Harry. And in it, you're standing askance to Megan, with a finger interlocked from each of your hands, and with a face that I can only assume was trying to look laid back, but actually looks like smugness corrupted by beta male weakness. Thanks. Uh, you're welcome. And you, Megan, I see that you made sure that you were standing in front of Harry again, like you did in your Time magazine shoot, where Harry looked like a giant ginger epaulette made out of plasticine and with his hair thickened by digital wizardry. Oh, you um noticed, did you? Yeah, it's important that we break through the archetypes that hold women back. Stereotypes. So, like, it's a very powerful message, right? when strong women, you know, perhaps even dominant women. No doubt about it. And take a step forward, you know, both literally and figuratively. Maybe even metaphysically. And lead the way into a brighter tomorrow. And what exactly is that? I, I don't know destinations, you know, I can't precisely define what this better world would look like, what it'll be. Oh, but she'll be sure to claim it was her vision when we get there. <laughs> but I do know one thing about this better future, and it'll be one where women use their intellect passionately and their hearts you know, sensibly. I don't know how she does it. You know, when women think about things, they got to think about them with a furious heat, right? You know, to come up with a solution so this you know, for the problems of the decaying world. But when they're, when they're listening to their hearts, when they're, when they're going to listen to their heart, they've got to be guided, you know? They've got to just quieten down, take a step back, and, you know, be chilled out. Chilled out. Hot head, cool heart. That's right, Harry. My Megan has got a head as hot as a furnace and a heart as cold as ice. With a display of characteristic professionalism, Megan, you've employed a fact-checker for your podcast, which is, of course, misnamed Archetypes. Yeah, I just thought it would be best to, you know, get an independent fact-checker for the podcast to make sure that, you know, everything's up to scratch and on the level. You've selected a woman, of course, and a very brilliant woman. Yeah, you know, I was just looking for an independent fact-checker who was really excelling in their personal life and in their personal interests. And, you know, they can come on and really hold the show to account, you know, and you know, maybe even me to account, if, if necessary. <laughs> I don't think that'll be necessary. <laughs> and if she actually did, I mean, can you imagine? And what I really want to do is avoid the accusation that I'm creating a low energy echo chamber only interested in pushing narratives that are beneficial to grievance mongers and those who feed off the all-pervasive victim mentality. Oh, what a thing to suggest. However, you have selected a virtual carbon copy of yourself, Megan, albeit one with slightly more literary ability, uh, Nicole Pazolka, uh, whose interests include criminal justice, activism, music, business, queer culture, and gender. It's almost like a rewritten version of Billy Joel's We Didn't Start the Fire, but with more beautiful lyrics. Yeah, you know, she's a very talented, multi-talented individual who's got a wide range of interests in the crucial themes and subjects of the day. 
Yes, well, subjects and themes that have been artificially thrust to the peak of conversation in the last 20 minutes, and that we discuss instead of the very real economic, social and moralistic collapse happening as we speak. Yeah, those are the ones. Yeah, she's a really great addition to the team. I'm sure. I mean, how could anyone who describes themselves as an activist not be? Touché, Dr. Jackson. She's also recently published a book entitled How You Get Famous. <gasps> Why Megan could be writing that with a left hand, or still a right hand holding a ultra-vegan, no fat, no taste, no foam, avocado milk, chai latte. Uh, the book is actually a deep dive into New York City's underground drag scene and has been praised as an engaging book that will appeal to scholars of gender as well as anyone with an interest in queer culture. At last, someone's filled the void. I mean, there's been a demand there for years. Yes, if you want to know anything about drag culture now, you have to ask a six-year-old. But Megan, considering the term fact-checker is rather contentious, lacking as we are a book of unbiased truth etched into the rocks of reality, is Miss Pazuka really going to contradict anything you say that's convenient to her narratives, which, as we've already established, almost completely mirror yours? Well, you know, what can I say? I mean, truth mirrors truth. Oh, we're thinking about taking her on the road with us. <laughs> Sing on the road again, Harry. Or can't he, or Willie Nelson? Uh, Willie Nelson. On the road again. Do, 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 do. Just can't wait to get on the road again. Do, 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 do. I found love was making music with my friends. Do, do, do. And I can't wait to get on the road again. In the latest episode of your podcast, Megan, you turn your ample reserves of moralistic fire upon Hollywood, complaining at their stereotyping of Asian women as overly sexualized or aggressive. Now let's calm down or I'll get Lucy Lou on you. Well, you know, no body or institution should be immune from criticism if they've played a role in archetyping Stereotyping. Vulnerable members of society, you know, vulnerable communities like Asian women. And Hollywood have been guilty of that. So, <laughs> when my Megan's got her mind set on something, nothing gets in her way. She'll do anything. Anything. Hmm. In uh, the demystification of the dragon lady, racist! But that was the title of the podcast, Harry. I came up with that name. Oh, did you? Right. I must get around to watching it. In the podcast, you mentioned specific films as examples, including, and I quote, the one-dimensional Japanese female characters in Austin Powers' Gold Member, which sexually tokenized Asian women, and Kill Bill, where Lucy Liu... Lucy was the ruthless and vicious leader of a crime gang. Exactly. You know, it's awful that Hollywood feels like it needs to pander to these archetypes. Uh, stereotypes. But Lucy Liu herself has defended the film. And we must remember that the group of assassins to which she belonged was comprised of mixed genders, nationalities and races. Yeah, but where are the pan-genders? Oh, they hadn't been invented yet, Harry. That's true. Uh, what I'm getting at is, Megan, are you just finding problems on behalf of other communities that they themselves aren't bothered about, just so you can justify your endless preaching and, indeed, the very concept of your podcast? No, no, because I had three Asian women on my podcast, and they all agreed with me. Yeah, amazingly Asian. Yes, you had a comedian Margaret Shu, a sociologist Nancy Wang Yun, and a journalist Lisa Ling. I'm afraid I hadn't personally heard of uh, any of them. Yeah, which proves my point. 
Yes, although it does also play to the possibility that they are merely drawing sustenance from a perceived evil that would, if eliminated, eliminate the need for them. Sociologists in particular. Oh, sociologists always get a bad rap. That's so unfair. Because you know, I went to one once to help with my social skills. What did he say? Uh, go away. Uh, Kate Blanchard has ridiculed the idea of my truth in a recent interview with Harper's Bazaar UK, saying that truth is just truth, isn't it? Sorry, Kate who? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, she also added that language is so important. My perspective is one thing, but my truth? I just don't know what that means. You now, people need to be able to speak their truth, okay? You know, it's a fundamental right. You know, it's a human right. Oh, that is, unless your truth is made up of heinous lies against my Megan. No, my truth is, my truth is, how would I describe it? Um, tell us your truth about the meaning of my truth. Uh, my, yeah, my truth is a opportunity, in essence. It's an opportunity to give, you know, expression to your momentary oneness, you know, like, to give validation to your to your life, to your being here in time. It's like Shakespeare reborn. To escape the shackles of judgmentation, you know, the judgmentation of others, you know, that with that try to hold you back with their strict version of truth, you know, rigid version of truth. Oh yeah, those times are gone. It's all up for grabs now. Uh, yes, that does seem to be the case, Harry. Although, Megan, do you agree with Mrs. Fairground Bouquet, whose cat is a Tom and whose dog was a stray, who says, my truth merely means personal experience or opinion, for which we already have perfectly suitable words, meaning that the overuse of the term my truth actually corrupts the real word truth. I really disagree with that. No, I really, really disagree with that. In fact, I can't tell you how much I disagree with that. I literally can't tell you. So I'm going to hand over to Megan to explain. Megan. Yeah, I think that Mrs. Fairground Bouquet. Oh, yeah. And that's another thing. Mrs. Fairground Bouquet. I mean, where do you find these people? Uh, well, uh, Mrs. Bouquet is a retired microbiologist who has received multiple awards for innovation in her field. Uh, she retired early so that her and her husband could become foster parents to abandoned and underprivileged children. Well, isn't she a saint? As I was saying, I think that Mrs. Fairground Bouquet has missed the subtle significance of affirmation. You know, a personalized certification of our precise individual wavelength. Uh, yes, Megan, it's fascinating. Although, does it not concern you that to some, this is little more than asinine psychobabbling pomposity delivered in beglittered sophistry? Why are you looking up? Asinine or sophistry? Delivered. Jeff took a good job in the city. City. Working for the man every night and day. And I never lost one minute of sleep. And worrying about the way things might have been. Oh, the big wheel keep on toying. Proud Mary keep on boiling. Rolling, 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 rolling on the river, rolling on the river. Listen to the story now. Clean the lot of plates in Memphis. 
Uh, Jeremiah, the compulsive liar who became a pariah impersonating a friar, asks, is it true that you're looking for a new home in Hope Ranch? Yeah, you know, we have to get out of there. I mean, it's crazy. I mean, we had two break-ins in like 12 days. Huh, which is almost three weeks. Um, it's almost two weeks. Yeah, I'll admit, it's close to two weeks as well. But I think you'll find, if you do a little digging, you know, intellectually. Oh, no. I think you'll discover that it's nearer to three weeks than it is to two. It is close to two weeks as well. So, you know, well done. And a good try. Well, no. Uh, numbers are a fundamental ingredient to the broth of reason, so I can't let that go. Uh, twelve days is less than two weeks, so it follows unequivocally that twelve days is closer to two weeks than it is to three. No? Okay. We'll agree to disagree. <laughs> you know, obviously uh, Harry's embarrassing both of us right now. But I have to say, I'm a little bit disappointed in you too, Dr. Jackson, with your, you know, admiration for the so-called broth of reason. <laughs> I think you'll find, he said, chowder of common sense. <laughs> My little pickle bunny. Oh my God, there's so much wrong with what you just said there, Harry. And it was broth of reason. <laughs> okay, definitely. Yes, but in fairness, I think I prefer chowder of common sense. Don't encourage him. Oh. Well, anyway, please carry on with your description of your disappointment, however positive I am that it will be faux intellectual pseudo-scientific claptrap. Oh, oh, see, Megan? Cobalt actually lets you speak your truth. I know, but you're grasping on to this logic and reason stuff, Cobalt. You know, it's like, like a baby holding on to their favorite teddy. You know, and if you carry on doing that, in the end, you're going to end up n not going with the flow of, of my description of my moment and my truth. Such a good point. Oh, no, please, don't be concerned, Megan. You know, I'm a communist, of course. Of course. So I will never allow reason or actuality to infect my ideological standpoint. Well, that's nice to hear, because they are the two most effective and aggressive vectors of white supremacy and racism. Both? Yeah, and racial discrimination. Well, out with logic and reason then. But let's get back to Jeremiah the Compulsive Liar's question about moving from Montecito to Hope Ranch. He also says he's heard that the residents of Hope Ranch aren't thrilled about your arrival. Huh, rednecks. Well, it is a gated community around walled and gated estates that average $22 million in value. Yeah, okay. Rednecks who made it big in a tech world. <sighs> in Extracts from Courtiers, The Hidden Power Behind the Crown by Valentine Lowe, it is claimed, Harry, that you've had a long-term fear since way before you met Meghan that you'd become an also-ran, a has-been once Prince George turned 18. I can honestly say I've never had a fear about anything in my entire life. Well, except upsetting Megan, of course. <laughs> That's not fear. That's sheer, unbridled terror. So there's not a shred of truth to what the book alleges? Allegedly. The things they say, allegedly. The games they play, allegedly. Allegedly. Look, let's be honest. He was going to become a has-been, you know? It might sound harsh, I'm sorry, but it's a fact, you know? And that's just the nature of the royal family, you know? Who's in and who's out and you know, who's in the inner circle and la la la. You know, so, you know, I'm afraid it was, it was the case. And when I first saw Harry, when I first looked at him, I thought to myself, that's someone who's going to become a has-been.
<laughs> How sweet. So are you suggesting that you've helped Harry avoid that unceremonious fate? Look, well, you know, no one's forgetting about him now, are they? You know, he's in the papers like 10 times more often than his brother, William, you know, future king of England. So, yeah, I'm front and center of the next cultural revolution. Uh, well, no, I wouldn't say front and center. No? Well, no, 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 I mean, yeah, you are in the focal point of the dawn of a new tomorrow, but more like in a sidecar. I suppose you're driving the main engine forward then, Megan. You know, every movement needs a leader, you know? Leaders are selected by events, you know? Leaders emerge at the right time, at the right moment in history, you know? It is what it is. Some of us are finding out rightful place, you know, on the pedestal of history. And my place is right by Megan's side, you know, behaving well and earning my extra half an hour of screen time on Tuesdays and Fridays. Thank you. Thank you. You know, and Harry could never be leader. I mean, it just doesn't suit him, you know. He's like a, a deer in the headlights sometimes. Which means I can make silly decisions sometimes, you know, ones that ruin my life and negatively impact those around me. You know, horrendous decisions that I can't ever take back, you know, however bad it gets. Indeed. Yeah, you know, and you can't have someone like that, you know, driving things forward. You just, you just can't. I, it's too risky. So it's the sidecar for me. And Harry's happy with that. Aren't you, Harry? Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm happy. Yeah. Happy as Larry. Yeah. yeah. As happy as I've ever been. Happy as I could ever be. Yeah. Yeah. Especially now, I've stopped wasting time enjoying myself and instead properly concentrating on my mental health. So we found our proper places, right? You know, in the grand scheme of things. You know, we've, we've gravitated to our correct station in life. I'm happy playing second fiddle to Megan. It's far better than when I was playing fiddle with Kevin Spacey. I wasn't so keen. Yeah, and this way Harry hasn't got to be, you know, an also ran, you know, or has been. Just dumped on the side of the road when people are finished with him. Well, at least not yet. Uh, in the newest episode of your podcast, Megan, you discuss the damage caused by the common use of terms like crazy, hysterical, insane, and out of your mind to describe people and their actions, particularly women. Yeah, it's a real problem, you know, to take a collection of behaviors and character traits and then archetype them, stereotype them. As being crazy, you know, it really damages their ability the capacity to speak freely, you know, when other people go around labeling them as crazy, you know, right? You know, how, how can we expect them to be able to speak freely? Yeah, it's very funny, actually, because it's freedom of speech that prevents people from speaking freely. Oh, how delightfully droll. I mean, it's amazing, isn't it? I mean, speaking freely is amazing, but freedom of speech lets people say nasty stuff which actually stops people speaking freely. Huh. I mean, it's amazing, isn't it? It's amazing. Yeah, obviously, it's a little bit more complicated than just the nasty things people say. It's about the creation of archetypes, the stereotypes, that has a deeper and more pernicious effect you know, on society and society's ability to be able to express itself without concern. Oh, so you do agree with freedom of speech then, Megan? Oh, no, no, you know, freedom of speech is fraught with danger, you know, as we've seen. Yeah, I, I, I just can't, I, 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 I just can't get over it. You know, it's freedom of speech that prevents people from speaking freely. I mean, mind blown. What we need is speech codes that prevents people from using uninclusive language. 
right? The sort of uninclusive language that reinforces awful archetypes, stereotypes. And if people can't say it, then in the end, they won't be able to think it. And then, paradise. Yes, well, thank you for your Wittgenstein-infused Orwellian insight, Harry. But who exactly would derive these speech codes? Experts. Yeah, you know, experts at the perpetuation of hypernormative archetypes at the symbolic and unconscious level. Yeah, super brainy boffins that, if given all the power, can make it all better for us. Well, I have a question here from a Mr. Starmer the Farmer, who's known as a charmer, as far as I can garner, who asks, do you see any potential problems in handing over the innate capacity of free expression to an unaccountable coterie of zealous regulators? No, not at all. Not at all. Not one bit. No, <laughs> I didn't even understand the question. Uh, returning to the most recent episode of your podcast, Megan, you spoke about discovering that the word hysterical comes from the Greek word for womb. Yeah, you know, and archetypes were laid down, right? Even in the time of like Plato. Stereotypes. Yes, we have a quote here from the show. You said Plato himself was actually amongst the Greek philosophers who believed that the womb would travel around the body, adding pressure to other organs, which would lead to erratic and unreliable behavior. Yeah, even Plato was a dirty sexist. It just shows you how prevalent these archetypes, stereotypes, have been throughout Western history, you know, maybe even world history. You know, even the greatest thought leaders of antiquity were contorted to such an extent by their toxic masculinity that they made up stories about wombs traveling around the body and causing hysterical behavior. I sometimes find it hard to believe what kind of idiots were around back then. Yes, Harry, imbeciles. Although, in all fairness, the womb travelling around the body could have been an antiquated understanding of hormones. Nonetheless, Megan, do you see any irony in you and your like-minded liberal friends critiquing Plato and other Greek philosophers? Irony. Okay. Uh, how? Why? The only irony I can think of is that they were celebrated thinkers. Yeah, celebrated thinkers, but they didn't think, get this, they didn't think, even for a second, that they might just be being a little bit sexist. <laughs> yeah, they didn't think to themselves, not even for a moment, that maybe my masculinity is being a bit toxic. No, they were completely oblivious to it. Uh, yes, although I'm not sure they had terms for such a concept, Harry. Toxicos andrismos. Oh, my mistake. And what exactly is the implication here? That Plato is untouchable, you know, immune from criticism? Protected by ancient Greek privilege? Oh, come on. Oh, no, not at all. I freely admit that Plato has more than a whiff of the totalitarian authoritarian about his work and his thoughts. Yet he is also an undeniable staple of the intellectual pantheon of thinkers who have shaped Western culture, and indeed, the nature of formal reasoning itself. Yeah. And you're you. She certainly is. Uh, you also took a swipe at psychologist Jordan Peterson. Racist? Yeah, absolutely. You know, he even had the nerve to say, I don't think men can control crazy women. I mean, there is so much wrong with that statement. I, ca I, can't, even, I can't even begin. Men controlling women. <laughs> Big no-no. Well, I'll admit, I don't know the full context of the statement, so I can't comment on it. However, surely context is important in this case. I mean, all people can be crazy at certain times. You know, men or women. Ah, here we go. And it should be noted that tens of thousands, probably hundreds of thousands of men have credited Jordan Peterson with improving their lives, helping them find meaning, purpose, 
discipline and escaping the destructive addictions that riddle so many wasted lives. Uh, encouraging people to take accountability, have integrity, and treat each other with more kindness and less jealousy. Whereas the only known effects you've had on people, Megan, are manipulation, abuse, bullying, and betrayal. Ooh, hashtag just saying. That was the video. If you want to see any more of this mad lot, it might be worth hitting the notification bell and subscribing, liking, and sharing the channel. Thanks. Uh, we have a question here sent in from Belinda Melinda, who's having no luck on Tinder. She asks you, Megan, why you thought it acceptable to wear blood-soaked earrings sent to you as a wedding gift from Saudi Prince Mohammed bin Salman. Oh, well, I think we're discovering why she's having no luck on Tinder. Belinda, get your facts straight. Oh, I believe that they are the correct facts, Harry. Are they not? Quite possibly. Look, I, I received a nice pair of diamond chandelier earrings from some guy in the Middle East, you know? No biggie. Oh, come on, come on. Is my Megan really supposed to keep tabs on every piece, every single piece of priceless jewellery she's been sent by dictators? Yeah, exactly. You know, you know, I didn't know really much about him, but hey, they were gorgeous. I mean, absolutely gorgeous, you know, and yeah, I accepted them. I mean, who wouldn't? Uh, those with integrity? Exactly. And how many people have got that? None. None that I know. Uh, is it not a little embarrassing for you, Megan? Perhaps more than just embarrassing, considering the Saudi prince is linked to the murder of Jamal Khashoggi at the Saudi consulate in Istanbul. Yeah, okay, that wasn't good, but I've never worn them since then. Well, even without the political murders and dismemberings, Meghan, he does seem an unlikely bedfellow, considering his active endorsement of the Saudi Arabian regime, whilst you harp on about equity, social justice, and indeed the plight of women in Saudi Arabia. My Meghan has got to look her best, okay? And just because Bin Sally What's-His-Face has got a little bit of blood on his hands, you know, allegedly, Allegedly. Uh, no. Look, we can't hold the jewellery responsible for the actions of its purchaser. You know? It's not fair on the diamonds. Nor is it fair on my Megan. Uh, you claim that you didn't know much about the Saudi prince, Megan. Although it seems odd that the media were originally told that the earrings were borrowed. Almost as though you were trying to hide the fact of where they were from. Look, look, has she tried updating her profile pictures? Uh, excuse me? Her profile pictures. I mean, if she's not having any success, then perhaps it's because she hasn't got very appealing profile pictures. Yeah, you know, I make sure she's got at least one photo with some friends. Otherwise, people might think she's like, you know, a loner, right? Sorry, I'm not following you. Melinda, Melinda, who's having trouble on Tinder. Oh, right. Sorry, yes. Yeah, well, tell her to keep trying, you know? She'll find the right person in the end. We did, didn't we, Megan? <laughs> that was the video. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you wouldn't mind liking and sharing and uh, hitting the subscribe button and uh, hitting the notification bell, oh, that'd be good. And uh, yeah, please join us again next time.